Watch this. Three major Idaho Republican debates won't be happening this primary season. The reasons are many, but the fallout may be singular. It only hurts the process, says a BSU professor. Their goal is to serve more people, and they had hoped to move into a bigger space to do just that. That was more than a year ago. Today, those for and those against Interfaith Sanctuary start a week-long process of deciding its future. A gift from Mother Nature gave thousands of skiers and snowboarders an extra day on the slopes, and from the looks of it, long lines were worth it for a bonus day at Bogus. So the party of Lincoln is refusing to participate in debates, which is ironic since the reason Republicans call themselves the party of Lincoln is, frankly, because of Lincoln participating in debates. A lot of them, seven debates in three months in 1858 against Stephen Douglas. Now, Lincoln may not have won that Senate seat for which he was vying. But by debating, Lincoln, the underdog at the time, catapulted himself into prominence and rode that wave to the presidency two years later. The Lincoln-Douglas debates, that back and forth, is the backbone of high school and college debate teams across the country, by the way. Now, to be fair and to be clear, not all GOP candidates have refused to face off with their opponents, but some high-profile options who've offered some varied reasons for refu refusal. By Friday evening, three Republicans running for three prominent positions had opted out. On Monday, Congressman Mike Simpson, citing sufficient circumstances, told the Idaho Press, Republican voters don't need to see anything more from Brian Smith, his opponent, when explaining why he didn't need to share a stage with his second congressional district challenger on Idaho Public Television. Representative Priscilla Giddings, running for lieutenant governor, at first agreed to participate on IPTV, but she told them she wanted the precondition of approving a, approval of panelists, something that IPTV has never allowed. So Giddings backed out. Then late Friday afternoon, Governor Little declined any invitation to debate on any format, IPTV or KTVB, claiming his record of historic accomplishments and facts as non-debatable. Three Republican candidates who said, basically, I'm good enough, he's not good enough, and you're not good enough. Were these decisions bad enough to leave a dent in our democratic process? Well, we asked that question of Boise State political science professor Dr. Jeffrey Lyons. His expertise is on American politics, public opinion about those politics, political behavior, and political psychology. So debates are kind of right up his alley. He told us there's several reasons why a candidate wouldn't want to debate. Maybe they feel the debate won't be fair or they feel comfortable in their campaign position well enough ahead that a debate would only be a downside. But Dr. Lyons said, given the decisions facing Republicans in this year's primary in Idaho, he says denying voters a chance at discerning that distinction between candidates is a big deal. And I think that a debate is a, is a nice place to articulate where candidates differ. And in, in Idaho, within the Republican Party, we do have some real difference. And so I think that not having a debate means that some voters may be less clear on the different choices that they have to make, right? It's, it's one less opportunity that they have to learn about the candidates. And so for some voters, it could mean that they are making decisions that they aren't quite as informed about because we've taken away one form of, uh, of them getting information, essentially. Would it be extreme to say it's like, the end of democracy as we know it when these things kind of go away like this? You know, I, I, would, I probably wouldn't say quite that, um, but it definitely, I think, is indicative of a, of a situation in our politics where we are struggling to have conversations across lines of difference. We are struggling to articulate difference in a civil fashion. We don't uh, trust our opponents. And in this case, it's interesting because this is within the party, right? These are our opponents who are within uh, a, a party. And so we would think that in that setting, perhaps uh, they would be able to, to have that kind of a conversation. But this is a, this is a national trend and people not feeling like or wanting to engage in, in conversations with folks who they don't agree with. That's a bad thing. I mean, that seems to be a problem. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Why? Um, when we are not able to engage with the other side, when we are not able to explain our reasoning, I think that does uh, bad things for our understanding of one another, first of all. We are less likely to know um, why somebody might disagree with us. In this particular case, I think it's a problem for voters. It, it takes away information from voters, and they're going to be reduced down to either having to do a lot of research on their own, perhaps, or stay uh, closely engaged with politics, 
or maybe they're going to make decisions on things that are less based on policy, right? Yard signs, things like this. And so, uh, in general, you're taking a, a, a part of the equation away from away from the citizens, and I don't think that's uh, necessarily going to lead to the best outcomes. Is it unfair to those who want to participate? <sighs> Boy, I don't know. That's a great question. I don't know if it's fair or unfair, but I, I think what it tends to do is it's probably a disadvantage to people who are lesser known, uh, people who uh, perhaps are challenging candidates. You know, uh, if, if you if you're well known and you have a long record, uh, voters do know quite a bit about you, and so you have less to lose from opting out. But if you're somebody who's new to the scene. Um, and you have some new ideas perhaps you want to share with, with voters, I think that definitely is a disadvantage to those folks. So I guess overall, I mean, it's an unfortunate situation, right? I mean, I, I tend to think, like globally speaking, in general, that it's not, it's not a healthy thing to opt out of debates. Uh, perhaps if you are concerned that a debate is going to be used for, as a platform to um, misrepresent what somebody has said or misrepresent somebody's record. Um, you feel like it's not going to be an honest debate on, on the actual merits of policy, um, then perhaps that wasn't going to be a productive debate or a productive conversation. There can be a downside to debates. There's no doubt about that. Um, but yeah, globally speaking, uh, opting out of discourse across lines of difference I don't think is a good thing. And look, we get it. We in the media have been talking about it for years. They don't need us. Politicians these days don't necessarily need the media to get their message out. Haven't for almost, well, a generation. Or as one famous Republican put it, for a full score. With websites and social media and echo chamber radio interviews, candidates and those elected can say whatever they want without the possibility of pushback on things like facts or even simple follow-up questions to clarify. We heard this a lot last week with regards to these canceled debates. Why would candidate A want to give any time or credibility to crazy candidate B or candidate C? But isn't fair and equal ac access the backbone to American democracy? That's the question we have. Then there was this one. Why would they want to answer questions from a partisan panel? That's not fair. Those people are just out to make Republicans look bad. First of all, it's really not how that works. A panelist's job is to just ask questions. The unedited answers are determined by the candidates. It's all live, unedited. Why does it matter who's asking the questions or, or if they're hard? Finally, for a candidate to claim their record is non-debatable, if it was, would you have anyone running against you? I have two teenage daughters on the debate team. Trust me when I say everything is debatable. Regardless of review on the media, statewide televised debates are a necessary function of democracy. And by not participating in one, you're refusing accessibility to voters who can't make it to one of your campaign events. They might even see how you would react to a stressful situation if you were to participate. So I guess the question, the last one we might have is, the message, this message that you're saying by opting out, refusing to participate. Is this the message to pass along to your kids or grandkids? It's only worth doing if it's perceived fair and easy? All right, week two of our political parcel tracker. Our producer's pile this week increased by, well, only a handful. Still a lot here today to show you. And since we first showed them to you last week, we've gotten a few questions about matters, or mailers, I should say, specifically about what they can and what they, what they can't say. Things like, well, take a look at this one. Priscilla Giddings mailed ads for election with an Idaho Air National Guard A-10 in the background, probably a violation of the Department of Defense directive policy. So this is the, uh, the mailer they're talking about here. You can see Giddings in front, standing in front of a jet there, uh, A-10, I presume. She's a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Air Force Reserve. And you can see that I said in front of that A-10 warthog. We looked into that viewer claim via the Department of Defense Directive Policy. And for those of you who don't know, it's a document that details what you can and cannot do as an active or retired service member in terms of politics. So if we're going off those rules, no, she's not in violation. It says candidates can mention their military rank or grade and military service, and their affiliation, but they must clearly indicate their retired or reserve status. However, there are several rules that say candidates cannot be in uniform in any political ad, whether that's on TV or in print, and obviously she is not. So Giddings is not breaking any rules by posing in front of an Air Force plane, an A-10 there, so that's because she included the required disclaimer at the very, very bottom, if you look at the picture, reiterating that by including the plane in the ad, it does not imply an endorsement by the Air Force nor the Department of Defense. So that's kind of how that played out. So no, she is not breaking any policy there. But speaking of political mailers, we told you how candidates are able to legally obtain your name and mailing address during election season. 
because if we heard from many of you, mailers are hitting mailboxes hard right now, and they get those from a database when you just register. They have all that on file, and it's public information. We told you what to do if you want to, get, if you want to opt out of those, specifically with the GOP mailers. And that got Sam and Boise asking this question. You mentioned how to be removed from the Republicans' role. How do I go, where do I go to get the Democrats to leave me alone, says Sam, or ask Sam. So we reached out to Idaho's Democratic Party, who gave us the similar answer. If you'd like to opt out of the mailers that they're sending you, all you have to do is contact them, and they will do their best to, well, identify them and then contact the candidates on their own and ask them to remove you. However, just like the Republicans, they may not stop, that may not stop you from getting these mailers in the first, or in the long run, because some campaigns, well, they're separate entities, and you may still receive some of these mailers, even if you choose to opt out. So enjoy them, make placemats out of them, whichever. All right, this continues to be a question we get at least once a week in our inbox. There still seems, though, to be some sort of confusion. Why are Idaho voters required to only vote for candidates in their party? I would really like to vote for the person, not the party, says Diane. Okay, so that email Diane sent us over the weekend. The simple answer is, well, it goes back to 2012. The Idaho Republican Party decided they wanted to have a closed primary election. They sued, and then the legislature changed it in 2011, so in 2012 they had their first closed primary, meaning only registered Republicans can vote in the primary for Republicans. The GOP believing Republicans, after all, should rightfully choose Republican candidates to represent them in the general election. So on election day, if you're registered with a Republican Party, with the Republican Party, you will get that Republican ballot handed to you with only Republican candidates. If you're registered as a Democrat or you're unaffiliated, you're going to get a ballot with other remaining candidates, like all of them. And that changes in the general election when everyone will get the same ballot regardless of party status. So is it too late to change your affiliation for the primary? Well, yes, it is, unless you've never voted in an Idaho election before or, as regist or you are registered as unaffiliated. If that's the case, well, you can still register with the party of your choice on Election Day. By the way, the primary election coming up in 29 days. It's Tuesday, May 17th. You can still register to vote right now online or at the polls on Election Day. After more than a year of tense debates and hearings over moving one of the biggest homeless shelters in Boise, neighbors, the city of Boise, and Interfaith Sanctuary are appealing to a higher authority. That hearing is happening right now, and so is the time we open up the conversation to you. 208-321-5614. Use that to text us anything, anytime. Like, now would be good. Questions, comments, complaints, jokes. You can save the pictures, it's okay. As long as it's relevant to the 208. Just make sure to include your name in the hashtag, the 208. We're going to share as many as we can at the end of the show. Check Boise City Council. We'll hear from a number of people tonight. So Interfaith Sanctuary is not backing down in their fight to move their shelter to West State Street out of downtown Boise. More than a month after their conditional use permit was denied by planning and zoning, well, they're getting their appeal heard this week by Boise City Council. Today begins that lengthy process of hearing arguments and public testimony all over again. Katya Stepovic has been following this move or potential move from the start. And Katya, so they've had that appeal denied, or I mean, they've had mm -hmm. the uh, conditional use permit denied. Now they're in the appeal process. 
What changes between what they've been through and what happens tonight? Well, Brian, this has been a lengthy process. There's no doubt about it. We're about an hour in, and they're still hearing um, from Boise Fire Department. But Boise City Council tonight is going to hear from Veterans Neighbor Park Association, Interfaith themselves, as well as staff from Planning and Zoning Commission. But like we've always talked about for so long now, this has been almost a year and a half of back and forth, and it took us a lot of steps to get to where we are, and I want to lay that out for our viewers. So we put a little bit of a timeline together. Take a look at this. In January 2021, Inter Interfaith held their first virtual meeting with Veterans Park Neighborhood Association. Interfaith purchased the building on West State Street in April of 2021 and also submitted an application for a conditional use permit. Now, Mayor McLean paused the project in June of 2021 following tensions, of course, between neighbors and Interfaith. Shelter Better Task Force was created to try and find a compromise, a potential new location even for the shelter. Now, that was an eight-week eight process that went into late August. Now, in October 2021, Interfaith resubmitted their application for a conditional use permit. In December of 2021, Planning and Zoning Commission took up the application and heard public testimony, and that was over a month and a half long. Finally, in January 2022, Planning and Zoning denied Interfaith's application for a conditional use permit, which brought us to where we are today. Interfaith submitted their appeal to that denial in February and of course, this is going to be a weeks long process. I'm hearing maybe even into Monday. They are not going to hear any public testimony tonight. That's going to start tomorrow. No new public testimony will be allowed. It's going to be everyone who talked in front of the Planning and Zoning Commission in January. So lots to come and potentially a decision on Monday, Brian. That's interesting. So no new public testimony, just what people have already said for or against this project will be heard. Okay, that is interesting. All right, thank you very much, Katya. And so this is also what we a question we get uh, as we do this story on Interface Sanctuary. Why can't they just move to a different building? They see all these empty buildings around town. I guess the simple answer to that is they're so far into this process, but we were told if those buildings were available, well, they might be a consideration. But a lot of times they're either not or they cost way too much money. And they're this far into this process, they're going to try to see it through to the end.
Were you one of the thousands of people who were able to take advantage of the bonus snow day of a bogus over the weekend? Yeah, there were a lot of people, and this is why we had a lot of lines. Saturday morning up there for their Supply Chain Saturday. This courtesy, these pictures courtesy of Katie Sir Hewn, one of our digital producers. Only three lifts operating up at Bogus, which made for long lines, as you can imagine. Some wait times up to about 45 minutes. But not everyone, or I should say everyone, was just pretty much happy to be there, excited to get on the slopes for one other day. As you can see, this video courtesy of Bogus Basin. Lift lines didn't seem like much of a problem. Bogus said they had about 4,000 people show up for this supply chain Saturday. 90% of those who showed up were season pass holders, so they were limited on who could get day passes. Mid-season, the mountain usually can handle about 6,000 guests, but then they have 10 lifts open, which is three and 4,000 people. That explains the long lines. But, boy, overall, mountain managers said feedback for Supply Chain Saturday was extremely positive. And now Bogus is once again officially shut down for the season, we think, I guess. Mother Nature, though, can always make some different plans. She's also going to have a say in the start of the summer season, activities up at Bogus Basin, mountains biking, mountain coaster, tubing, all those kind of things, so stay tuned. Usually I say sunshine is a big mood booster, but in this case it was the snow that was a huge mood booster for I think everyone across the state, especially farmers and ag workers throughout our state as well. It really did, uh, it was a significant boost for our snowpack as well. So I looked in the archives, this is the snowpack values that we saw on March 29th. That was the last time that I updated this graphic. So I wanted to roll it ahead to where we're at right now, but notice on this map right here, there is no green, there is no close to 100% of average at the end of March when we experienced one of the driest Februarys on record. But now, finally putting green back in the map, clear water up through northern Idaho, central and northern Idaho. The Weezer River Basin is in the green as well, liking these numbers a whole lot more. Still in the yellow for the Payette Basin as well as the Boise Basin, but the numbers are going up and we may continue to see them go up through the next week or so as we still have some more moisture and some more precipitation that's headed in our direction. Not today, though, enjoying temperatures that are about 10 degrees above seasonal averages, 71 right now in Boise. Hopefully you got a chance to enjoy it. It was breezy. It still is breezy, but we still have a nice evening ahead of us. Perhaps maybe you'll dine al fresco outside on the patio, uh, grilling up the first burgers of the season. And then as we get into the overnight hours, this is our cold front rolling through and it will cool our temperatures off. In fact, I think some of our technical highs for tomorrow will happen at midnight because because we won't be able to warm up to those levels tomorrow afternoon. So at least for the daytime high temperatures that we'll experience tomorrow afternoon, probably in the low to mid 50s, generally speaking throughout the Treasure Valley, it is much cooler tomorrow. And there's also a slight chance for a spot shower to make its way through as well. There's your 30% chance that you'll need the rain gear or the umbrella at any time tomorrow. A nicer day, more seasonable temperatures expected on Wednesday before another round of mountain snow and valley rain comes through on Thursday. You can always find the freshest forecast at KTVB.com. Love that perspective, Bree. Thank you very much. Got another viewer question for you. Tammy Blanchard asks, does anyone know if the road to Silver City is open to get into town? That's a good question for those of you new to the area. Silver City, it's an old mining ghost town. Not completely ghosted because there's still some people that live there, but it's about 70 miles south of Boise, southwest of Boise in the Hawaii County Desert. Way up high in the mountains, by the way. 6,100 feet above sea level. Way back when, back during the Civil War, Idaho was in the midst of a gold rush. Silver City was founded in 1863 and quickly became a booming metropolis. At its peak, there were more than 2,500 people living there, along with 75 businesses. And it was the first county seat as well, including Idaho's very first brothel and its first newspaper. By 1942, though, the mines had all closed. The city eventually fell, well, pretty much dormant, other than the people that still live there today. Several ghost towns reside or are in Idaho, but that's one you could still get to and you could see a little bit of life there as well. Most of the road is, well, sort of paved. It's at least treated, but once you get into the mountains, the road turns to dirt and, well, pretty potholy. Some parts can be pretty narrow as well. In the winter, they're basically impassable unless you have a snowmobile. So do not try to get there by car, which is why it is closed every year between November 1st, usually sometime around Memorial Day. We'll keep you in touch. So if you're still a, a month, we are still about a month out for that. We'll let you know when that road does open.
All right, final moments of the show for your comments like this one here from Bill, who kind of, well, says the things a lot of people might be thinking. Recent examples of election debates have been anything but real debates. Some of the blame falls on the debate organizers who have a clear bias. Some fall on the candidates who just want to belittle the opponent. It's a very good point. They've just kind of gone off the rails at times, both nationally and sometimes even locally. The Idaho candidates that refuse to debate are being very arrogant. Idaho voters have the right to hear their opinion, says Judy. Well, you can hear their opinion. They put it out a lot on social media and in some of the ads that you see on TV. The question is, do you want to see how they respond to maybe a comment or a question they might not like or find difficult. That's kind of where you see some of their true steel there. What about the annoying text you get from the candidates in the middle of the night, early morning, asked Jeff. So yeah, you get the flyers, but yeah, the text messages. We talked about this last week as well. Sometimes when you register, you have the option of putting in your phone number, and sometimes they just get it because you know what? People are selling your information and they're giving it to them. 